Hello and welcome. It's such a joy to open the Word together with you today. My name's Tom and I have the pleasure of serving here at the street. Um, and today, if you're joining us for the first time, we're in this book called Ruth, which is in the Old Testament. And it's been a beautiful series as we've journeyed through this book. And today we, we get to close off this series by looking at two chapters, three and four. But before we jump in, I just want to give a quick recap of week one and week two as we looked at chapter one and two. Um, so week one, we read a bit about uh, Naomi and, and her daughters-in-law and how they went through a great deal of suffering as they lost their husbands and um, their husbands passed away. And we looked at how God is present in the suffering and he's present in our suffering today when we go through it. Um, and week two, we were introduced to Boaz. Um, we began to see the special relationship between Boaz, who showed great kindness, and Ruth, who showed real diligence in her work. And so today, as I said before, we find ourselves in chapter three and four. And I don't know about you, but... Um, if you're someone who has never read the Bible before, or, or if you're someone who's read the Bible hundreds of times, um, you can notice how through the whole Word of God, God seems to just be weaving this beautiful story through all the Scriptures about who He is and about His plans and, and, and the plan that He has, um, that He is outworking. And this story that that we've been reading in Ruth, I think really paints a beautiful picture of that. And, and chapters three and four especially really point us to Jesus. And so today what I want us to do is, is go searching through these uh, verses in chapters three and four. And let's go looking, let's go searching for Jesus and where we see him. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to pray. So why don't you join me in prayer? Uh, Lord, we thank you for this time that we have to read your word together. Lord, right now, I just want to ask that you would speak to us, Lord. We don't just want to hear words from me, God. We want to hear straight from you. So speak, Lord. We're listening. Help us to obey what you say to us, Lord. Um, in your wonderful, wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, as I said before, we've got two whole chapters to get through, but don't worry, I'm not going to read every single verse. Uh, but what I will do is go through sections and I'll elaborate a little bit on them. Um, so please go back and read through the full, uh, full two chapters in your own time. But um, why don't you grab your Bible and let's start off by reading Ruth chapter 3 verses 1 to 6. <clears throat> it says this, One day Ruth's mother-in-law Naomi said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose woman you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he, until he has finished eating and drinking. When, when he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. <clears throat> he will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. So we read here that Naomi felt a real desire to make sure Ruth had security in her life. Also, Naomi was actually reliant on Ruth's support. And so both women needed someone to come to their aid. And marriage was the only real option they had. And this was, this was not a strange suggestion uh, that Naomi was making to Ruth. Um, for Ruth and Boaz had, had been around each other for a while. So they, so they were familiar with each other. They weren't strangers. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I was thinking, why do they need to be related? It was important that Boaz was a relative. But in our context today, that sounds kind of weird. But in the context of the time, Naomi's suggestion to marry a relative was to marry someone that was referred to as the family Goel, otherwise translated as the kinsman redeemer. <clears throat> and I just want to unpack this real quickly, this kinsman redeemer, because I think it's beautiful and it carries a theme throughout these two chapters. You know, the kinsman redeemer is a male relative who, according to various laws, had the privilege or responsibility to act on behalf of a relative who was in trouble, in danger, or in need. And so kinsman, if you break it, kinsman redeemer, if you break it down, kinsman means blood relation. 
Redeemer means saviour, rescuer, guardian. And there were four key responsibilities for a kinsman redeemer. He was responsible for buying a fellow family member out of slavery. He was responsible to be the avenger of blood. So he would make sure that uh, the murderer of a family member would answer to the crime. He was responsible for buying back family land that had been forfeited. He was responsible to carry on the family name by marrying a childless widow. And so Boaz was recognized as a kinsman redeemer for the family of Elimelech, who was the dead husband and father-in-law of Ruth. Uh, Sorry, the husband of Naomi, dead father-in-law of Ruth. Uh, Therefore, it was more than appropriate for Ruth to ask Boaz to marry her. And then we also read how Naomi instructs Ruth to approach Boaz. So let's read verse 3 and 5 again. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. That is godly wisdom, that. Do not approach him until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note that the place where he is lying Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will go. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. You know, this is not a a sexual gesture, as we may think today. But in the culture of the day, this was seen as an act of total submission. In those days, the role of a servant was to lay at their master's feet and wait for a command to be given. So what Naomi is suggesting here to Ruth is to approach Boaz in total humility and submission like a servant. How beautiful. Let's move on. Let's read uh, verses 7 to 9. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly and uncovered his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. So just picture this, right? You've got Boaz. He's asleep. (laughs) Sounds like he's in quite a deep sleep. He's sleeping in a position to guard the grain that they have gathered from any thieves of of the time. Um, And so he is fast asleep. And so no wonder he gets the fright of his life as as he notices a woman just sleeping at his feet. And then what Ruth does is she essentially goes on uh, to ask Boaz to take her in marriage. In verse 9, I'll just read how she says this. She says, when Boaz had asked, who are you? She says, I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. And this was a culturally relevant way to say, I'm a widow. Take me as your wife. Um, To me, that sounds awfully forward of her to suggest that. But Ruth knew that she was asking a kinsman redeemer of the family. So she felt no shame in asking Boaz of that. And now look at Boaz and how he responds in such a beautiful way to Ruth. He says this in verse 10. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than which you showed earlier. You have not run after younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Now, Boaz seems quite, I guess, humbled at, at Ruth's approach to him. He doesn't, doesn't sound like he's an extremely good-looking or young, uh, got-everything-going-for-him kind of guy. Um, as he suggests that she could have gone for a younger man. But Boaz also shows in his response that he was attracted to Ruth's no- godly, noble character, and he is humbled at her request to marry her, to marry him, sorry. So up until this point, right, we've made our way from verse 1 all the way through to verse 11. And up until this point, it all seems like the perfect romance story. 
You know, Ruth has played her cards well. She's approached Boaz. I probably would have approached him differently, not in the middle of the night and crept up and slept at his feet. But she approached him in a way that was honoring to him. <clears throat> and, and it all seems to be going well. She's asked him to marry her. He's agreed. He's keen. And the next obvious step would be to get married, right? But then Boaz throws a real spanner in the works. As we read in verse 12 to 13, he says this, Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good, let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. <clears throat> Lie here until morning. So what this means is that although Boaz is, was, recognized, uh, was a recognized kinsman redeemer of the family, he could not marry Ruth until the closer relative declined to marry her. Man, in this moment, if Ruth must have been freaking out, right? Like she, she knows she wants to marry Boaz. She's made that so clear to him in the previous verses. And Boaz does as well. But what I think this shows us um, about Boaz is something wonderful about his character and his response. What it shows us, I think, is that Boaz was not willing to cut corners. He wanted to do God's will, God's way, and go about it properly. And he knew that if it was really God, that it would all work out. It would all work out if he honored the way that God wanted it done. And just to, I just wanted to park here for two seconds. And I think there's something that we can learn from this when it comes to life, when it comes to big decisions, when it comes to relationships and love like this story here. I think it can be so tempting to cut corners and go about things and not go about things in the proper way that God has designed and laid out for us, especially for the sake of finding love um, and keeping love. But Boaz showed real integrity here when he had the option to not in front of him. And this, uh, this, this chapter comes to a close with another four verses, which we're not going to read, but just to give you a quick overview for the sake of time, is that this chapter leaves us actually hanging on a bit of a cliff edge, really. Um, and Ruth, so what we've had, we've had Ruth has gone to Boaz, asked him to marry her. He's like, yeah, I'm keen as. But then he says, but there's someone else who actually has the right before me. And, he's, and then he just sends Ruth home for the night. That must have been an awful night for Ruth. Ruth goes home to Naomi, it says later on in, in chapter 16 and 17, and, and Naomi asks, how did it go? And Ruth, I imagine her response is kind of like, yeah, good, he gave me a whole bunch of barley to take home. I think that means he's interested, but I'm not quite sure because I know that I'm getting married, but in the morning, I just don't know who I'm getting married to. And so that's kind of where we land this chapter three. So there's a, a whole lot of uncertainty for Ruth here. But let's jump into chapter 4 and continue this story from verses 1 to 4. Meanwhile, while Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there, just as the guardian, just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, <clears throat> Sit here, and they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that, that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. Do you notice how Boaz was so, so, so clever in his approach to this kinsman redeemer? Notice here that he first of all mentions that there's only land to be redeemed. And like any bloke, I'm sure he was like, Anyone would be interested in a piece of land to add to their portfolio. I'm sure interest rates were really low at the time and he could squeeze a whole bunch of high-density housing onto the plot of land. But 
I wonder how Ruth and Naomi were feeling at that moment as, he, as this other kinsman redeemer said, I will redeem it. You know, Boaz actually followed the law of the time perfectly. If he had just gone ahead and married Ruth, he could have gotten himself in a whole lot of trouble legally with this other kinsman redeemer. And so Boaz actually played his cards so right by completely following the law while also making it more likely that he would end up with Ruth, even though it doesn't seem that way. And we read in verses 5 to 8 how Boaz then goes on to reveal the fullness of the deal. He says, On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also must acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to, be, to become final, one party took off the sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. That sounds like the small print at the bottom of like a document. <laughs> so the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. So we find out that this is not just a property transaction. This is about marrying Ruth and continuing the family name of Elimelech. <clears throat> and the other kinsman redeemer already had a family, already had um, sons. And so the thought of bringing home another wife to his current wife and then splitting his inheritance among other children uh, was more than what he wanted. He did not want to head that way. So... As we read, he gave the right to Boaz to redeem Ruth and marry her. You know, the difference that we see between these two kinsmen redeemers of the family is that the other guy was motivated by possession, while Boaz was motivated by love for Ruth. Boaz was motivated by love for Ruth. I want you to keep that in mind as we move on. Now imagine the relief in Ruth and Naomi moments before. I'm sure they were standing there thinking, what a stupid idea, what a terrible way to go about making this happen, Boaz. But Boaz's plan that seemed foolish to them was working. Uh, verse 9 to 12, I won't read it, but we read that Boaz then took Ruth to be his wife. In verse 13, we read that uh, Boaz and Ruth went on to have a son. God graced them with a son and they named him Obed. And then they lived happily ever after. The end. Now, I don't think we are to just learn that two people found love, they fell in love, they got married and they had a child. I think there is a much bigger picture to this story that we've read about. And God has been at work throughout this whole book. You know, just one little amazing thing before, before we move on is out of this, their son Obed went on to be the father of a man called Jesse. And then Jesse went on to be the father of David, King David. And through the descendants of David, Jesus Christ was born. And what this shows me, as I said at the start, how when you read the scriptures, you see God just weaving this big story together. It's not just random little books here and there. You see God's hand through it all. This shows me that God used these seemingly normal people going about their normal life to outwork his plan to redeem humanity and provide a kinsman redeemer for us, just like he did for Ruth. So please don't lose sight of the bigger picture of this story. Now we started off in chapter three talking about how Ruth needed security in her life. <clears throat> she had plenty of possessions. But the possessions didn't provide that security. Only a special person could. And that person for Ruth was Boaz. Boaz was a good man. He was a kind man. He was a godly man. He showed undeserving favor and kindness. And he reached out to the foreigner, Ruth, and surprise, and, surprise, and provided security for her. And Ruth was the foreigner. She was an outcast in need of security and help. And she found that in Boaz. Do you see the parallels between Jesus and us in this story? Jesus is like Boaz. He's a good man. He's a kind man. 
and he shows undeserving favor and kindness to foreigners and he provides security for all who trust in him. And we, all of us here, are like Ruth. We are outcasts. We're in need of security and help and we find that fully in Jesus Christ. Can I say to you today, whether, you're, um, whether you follow Jesus or not, can I, can I um, encourage you and remind you that Jesus can bring security to your life? Because he is fully God, he can meet your every need. And because he is fully man, he can sympathize with what you need. Do you see how Jesus has been throughout this whole book? Throughout these couple of chapters that we've been reading now specifically, we see that Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. The Lord Jesus bought us for himself out of the curse, out out of our sin. He made us his own beloved bride and blessed us for all generations. He is the true kinsman redeemer of all who call on him in faith. You know, it says I've been reflecting on this passage and, and, and writing some thoughts down to share with us today. I've just been struck with the thought of without Jesus, I would be so lost. Without Jesus, I have nothing. I'd be broken. I'd be stuck in my sin. And I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for Jesus, our Redeemer today. I'm grateful for Him. I'm grateful that He has redeemed me from my sin. <clears throat> And I just wonder if, um, I had this on my heart specifically for people who maybe have been following Jesus for a long time and you've read this story a hundred times, you've read all the other uh, books in the Bible, but you've lost sight of what you've been saved from. And I just wonder if God wants to restore the joy of your salvation today as you return to Jesus, your Redeemer. Um, and it just when, when you do, it makes you so, so grateful for the faithfulness and the goodness of God. Because we don't deserve to be saved or redeemed. But Jesus redeemed us out of his great love for us. I love that parallel with Boaz because Boaz loved Ruth. He wanted to be the kinsman redeemer. And because Jesus loves us, he wanted to die in our place. He wants to redeem us. I just want to close by reading out these beautiful truths about Jesus, <clears throat> our kinsman redeemer. I say this, the kinsman redeemer had to be a family member. Jesus added humanity to his eternal deity so he could be our kinsman and save us. The kinsman redeemer had the duty of buying family members out of slavery. And Jesus redeemed us from slavery to sin and death. The kinsman redeemer had the duty of buying back land that had been forfeited. Jesus will redeem the earth that mankind sold over to Satan. Boaz, as kinsman redeemer to Ruth, was not motivated by self-interest, but motivated by love for Ruth. And Jesus' motivation for redeeming us in his great love is his great love for us. Boaz, as kinsman redeemer to Ruth, had to have a plan to redeem Ruth unto himself. And some might have thought the plan to be foolish. Jesus has a plan to redeem us. And some might think that his plan is foolish by saving men, by dying on the cruel cross. Yet the plan works and is glorious. Boaz, as kinsman redeemer to Ruth, took her as her bride. The people Jesus has redeemed are collectively called his bride. And one day he is coming back to take us home as his bride. Sorry, this gets me pumped, man. Boaz, as kinsman redeemer to Ruth, provided a glorious destiny for Ruth. And Jesus, as our redeemer, provides a glorious destiny for us. Amen. Amen. You know, maybe you're looking for security in your life today. Maybe you are wondering about how you can be forgiven from your sin. And can I ask you this question? Have you trusted Jesus with your life? Have you... Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Have you asked him to be your redeemer? Have you found your security in him? Because Jesus wants to be your redeemer. He wants to redeem you from your sin. So I just close with this question for you. How do you want to respond to Jesus, your redeemer today? 
Maybe you want to worship like you've never worshipped before. Maybe you just want to take some time now, wherever you are, to pray and to just reflect and thank Jesus, your Redeemer. Maybe you want to, wherever you are, thank Him out loud. Maybe you can't help but just shout for joy and say, thank you, Jesus. Maybe you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time. And if that is you, um, I, just, I just want to close by praying. And if you're someone who wants to give your life to Jesus for the first time, please just pray these words in your heart. There's nothing special about the words, but it's just a prayer, a prayer from your heart <clears throat> to Jesus, asking him to be your redeemer. Um, and if you do pray that, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you and help you uh, explore what it looks like to follow Jesus. So that's us for today. But I just want to close by praying. Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you for the way that you speak to us through your word. And Lord, right now, I um, just want to say sorry for my sin. Sorry for the way that I turn away from you. But Lord, I'm so grateful and I say thank you for saving me. Thank you for redeeming me. Thank you for buying me back out of darkness into light. And Lord, today I want to give my life to you whether for the first time or give, give my life to you afresh, Lord. I want to give my life to you today. So would you come and dwell in my heart and help me to live in a way that honors you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name we pray. Amen.